Major epilepsy warning on this one, folks. The opening titles for this set of episodes have to be the most seizure-inducing thing I've ever seen. Just rapid black and white flashes like a strobe light. It's very effective in conveying the, the gunfire in the night sort of theme they're going with, but nevertheless, uh, my brother has epilepsy, that's why I'm very attuned to this sort of thing. Heck, there's literally an Easter egg on disc 3 that's just a weird image and flashing lights for 45 seconds. Why? Anyway, let's get this over with, hopefully without crying. Friends, viewers, fans of all walks of life, we are gathered here today to celebrate the final second Doctor story. Though it would not be the last time Patrick Troughton would play the role of the Doctor thanks to anniversary specials. It was, however, the end of the Doctor number two's time in the TARDIS. I'm sorry, I need a minute. It's too bright in here. And what a farewell. The War Games is a massive 10 part serial from 1969 that comes on this really nifty 3 disc set, back before uh, 3 disc sets were the norm for the modern animated releases. I'm gonna have to make a video on my Doctor Who DVD collection journey one day, but man I remember 13 year old me working part time at a supermarket and I used to spend my tiny little paycheck on either a pre-owned video game or saving up for a 20% off sale at Whitcool so I could buy a new Doctor Who DVD. I remember too because I was saving for a two disc DVD, I don't remember which one it was, but that weekend when I went in and there was a 20% off sale, I saw this brand new three disc set on the shelf. I'm like, heck yeah, it's gotta be this one. At that point, I don't think I'd seen any black and white era Doctor Who aside from what introduced me to it, which was the Tomb of the Cybermen that played at the Doctor Who Appreciation Society at my high school. So that, combined with the 10 part nature, and the fact that I'm pretty sure I tried to watch it all at once after a 5 day school week and a Saturday work shift, no wonder I barely remember anything from this story. Put it this way, it's not beginner friendly, but then again, who'd be stupid enough to watch an actor's last go at playing the role as the Doctor as their introduction to the Doctor? This guy. This guy was that stupid idiot. Well, fast forward to over a decade, and here I am, doing my review series, revisiting it for the first time, one of the only three Patrick Troughton stories I'd ever seen before, and I, I, I did what I planned to do. I paced it out over a few days, and sure enough, I managed to gain a newfound appreciation for it. So, what's this serial all about? <laughs> right out the gate, there's an intriguing setup. The TARDIS appears to land in the middle of No Man's Land back in World War I. The war to end all wars, as they call it. But they quickly figure out that travelling far in either direction will lead you through a thick fog and out into another war zone in the middle of another conflict during Earth's history. So you leave the World War One zone and you're out into the Thirty Year War and you go through another bit of fog and you're out in, I don't know, the, the Romans versus the Trojans again. Go say hi to the First Doctor. And it hints pretty early on that there might be this one guy who's manipulating people and events. All this just in the first episode, culminating with the Doctor seemingly being executed by firing squad? You'd have thought the seventh Doctor would have been more cautious. Well, the first bunch of episodes, I'm pretty sure like the first four, are great and they have this real fantastic sense of mystery as the Doctor, Jamie and Zoe try and figure out just what the heck is going on and who's really in charge. Little could they possibly have known just how high up things would go. It must have been the end of episode four or five about the same time I took my second break, that the Doctor and Zoe got whisked away by another mysterious second TARDIS, that I found myself realising, like, hey, I'm really enjoying this! And that was probably the best time to take a break too, because I'll admit, episodes 5 to 7 are quite samey. It's very talky, and is almost exclusively reused interior environments. Whereas up until now was real world locations and really convincing looking sets. So like it just added bigger scale, like they really were going from, I don't know, zone to zone, something like the Hunger Games sort of thing. Whereas, yeah, these three episodes, it's like, all right, you're in a corridor, 
switch the camera around, it's a different corridor. At least it does uh, expand the scale of like the whole hierarchy of these bad guys. From army generals using glasses to mind control already brainwashed underlings to the war chief, a mysterious character who we'll learn more of later, the security chief, and of course the big bad above them all, the warlord. Although I gotta say the war chief is far more intimidating and has a way better backstory than his superior. For you see, he is in fact, a fellow Time Lord, at last confirming the Doctor's race and homeworld, although the name Gallifrey still isn't spoken yet. It's obvious in retrospect that the meddling monk was a Time Lord, I mean he had a TARDIS, but this is the first time a character was blatantly introduced as a Time Lord. So what does this mean for the Doctor? Well, it means he's way out of his depth, and the writing and Troughton's acting are at the forefront of the last three episodes. You see, the baddie's ultimate plan doesn't really make a lot of sense when you stop to think about it. The whole setup of capturing humans throughout various points in time and then programming their minds to believe they're fighting in specific wars throughout human history and then placing them in different locations to fight and kill each other in these fake wars, like that's all, you know, good sinister bad guy stuff, like that's compelling enough. But then it's, it's revealed that it's all in service of Mr. Big Bad Guy Warlord taking over the universe. How? It's a great idea, like, don't get me wrong, but from what I can recall, there's zero explanation of how this thing that they're doing can lead to galactic domination. It's, it's like the South Park joke, right? Where step one, get all these humans and force them to fight in a war. Step two. Step three, galactic domination. Just like the Crotons, what they're doing is, you know, typical villainous stuff, which is, you know, fine, but how does doing that translate to taking over the world slash galaxy slash universe? My answer? Don't think about it. I think they must have written themselves into a corner, because at the time they knew Patrick Troughton was done playing the Doctor, and obviously, I don't know, mustn't have chosen John Pertwee as a replacement yet, but so they knew how they wanted the story to end, but just couldn't quite connect the dots, despite having ten whole episodes to do it. And what an ending it is. Once the Doctor realises that despite saving the day, for the most part, he doesn't have the ability to get all these stranded humans back to their own time and space, he does the unthinkable, something he's been dreading and putting off for so long. He puts out a call for help and he summons the Time Lords. By using a telepathic cube! What did I say? Don't ask. Oh my goodness, and their impending arrival is sinister! The Doctor and the War Chief are both terrified of facing their own race, with the War Chief making one last ditch effort to flee before immediately being dispatched by the Warlord, who at this point is the only baddie left, aside from a couple of henchmen. The music is suitably ominous and keeps building and building while the Doctor tries so hard to retreat to the TARDIS with his companions, but just ultimately it's too late. The Time Lords have arrived. And episode 10 pretty much exclusively revolves around them. They finish fixing the situation, send all the humans back to their own place and time with their memories wiped, and brutally extinguish the Warlord and his cronies from all existence. Like, they never existed anymore. Damn. And although the Doctor puts up a good effort at his trial, we already know what's going to happen. For the supposed crime of interfering with time, the Doctor is punished, but thanks to his, his defense, he puts up a good case for himself and manages to convince them that like, hey, sure I may have interfered, but like, I'm actively stopping evil and tyranny throughout the galaxy. He is allowed to serve an exile on Earth, because <laughs> where else is he going to go? I mean, obviously for anyone who doesn't know, the real world reason is because production costs were getting too much and they were about to switch into filming in colour and they're like, we can't keep doing these sci-fi stories, so we'll just write into the show that the Doctor's going to get exiled on Earth so we can do a lot of stories just on Earth. So we don't have to pretend to be on alien planets and we can have the unit and all that fun stuff that I'm sure I'm going to enjoy. So the Doctor is sentenced to exile on Earth for an indeterminate amount of time set by the Time Lords without his precious TARDIS. But, of course, not without first changing his appearance. And here's something weird that I didn't pick up on the first time I watched this. Probably because I was new to the show, but... In the story, it's not explicitly clear that he's regenerating. But we know that that's what happens for continuity's sake. But yeah, the way they talk about it, they're not killing him or forcing him to regenerate, literally just changing his face. 
But of course, we know that he had to have died to regenerate. So it's, it's dark either way. After one final fruitless escape attempt, the Doctor bids farewell to his close companion, Jamie, who has been by his side since the beginning. And dear Zoe, who I still don't think is better than Victoria, but still was sad to see them go. And with that, the Doctor fades into the black void of bad special effects, and the credits start to roll. It's actually a pretty undignified way to go. Once his face started contorting, I thought, great, cut there, and we'll call the Seventh Doctor's regeneration a homage to that. But no, it, it, it just keeps going, and we get that silly, iconic scene of him spinning around in the void going, oh, 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 oh. Ah, well, not the end of the world. But it really is the end of a major era in the history of Doctor Who. The, the black and white era is done. Oh, Zoe, although I wasn't as attached to you as I was to Victoria, you weren't annoying, aside from screaming in the mind robber. But you played your part well, and I'm happy that you got a happy ending. Including a nice cameo from an actor who played the same character back in the world in space. That was some really neat continuity. Jamie, you Scottish bugger. I frickin' love Jamie. Easily one of the best Doctor Who companions ever. Never overstayed his welcome, and I absolutely love how enthusiastic and dedicated Fraser Hines was, and still is, to his involvement in Doctor Who. And of course, the man himself, Patrick Troughton. What a phenomenal upgrade from William Hartnell. Yes, I said it. Thinking back to all the times I had to make excuses for that old fart, the first Doctor was just miserable and plain unpleasant to watch for a lot of his tenure, until basically his last season. And of course, hearing about how old Bill Hartnell was on set, pff, nah, screw that guy. Sorry, Josh Snares, but I can easily see why old Pat was my good friend Andreas' favourite Doctor. His energy, enthusiasm and performance and love for the role shine through in every episode he ever did. I adore this incarnation of the Doctor and I'm going to miss him so much. I'm already looking forward to the three Doctors just so I can see him again. So that's it then. 50 serials, over 50 reviews, 6 seasons. The Black and White Saga is concluded. It's been a heck of a ride. So long mediocre reconstructions, so long missing episodes, you won't be missed. It's all DVDs, all full colour, all full steam ahead. What a journey. Thank you so much for sticking with me throughout this time. Since I started a year and a half ago, I've only had to take two unplanned breaks. Once was when the laptop I borrowed to make these reviews died over Christmas of 2021. And the other one was mid-2022 when I had to wait two months for the Abominable Snowman to release in New Zealand. And now I fear it is time for another unwanted break. My personal pre-owned laptop fully died back in 2017, so for the last several years, every video I've made for YouTube has been either on the PlayStation Studio software or on my partner at the time's laptop. Tamsin was always kind enough to let me borrow her laptop so I could continue doing my silly videos, but I'm afraid we are no longer in a position for that to happen. I find myself in need of my own laptop. But damn, these things are expensive. It would take me ages to save up for one as is, but I'm most likely going to be moving into a new place where I'll be having to pay almost twice as much rent. So saving isn't exactly an option for me right now. I don't know what I'm going to do yet, but one thing's for certain, I will definitely not be editing on my phone. No matter how much people swear by it, I will never be happy with a video that I've used a mobile editing software to make. But hey, chin up, I'm still committed to this. And who knows, maybe I'll record reviews as I go on my phone, and then sometime in the future when I get a chance, I'll have like hundreds of gigabytes worth of footage to edit into a bunch of reviews. It'll suck not being able to keep up my upload schedule, but, you know, that's life. Thank you from the bottom of my heart so much for watching and joining me on this journey. I have loved it so far and will continue to love it again when I return. The War Games is great, by the way. <laughs> I should probably mention that. But yeah, I'll still be around, and uh, hopefully you'll see me soon. <laughs>